Let's pray. Again, our Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for the many blessings we have already received this day. Again, Father, we praise you, bring honor and glory to you, bring holy, a holy uh, offering to your name, Father, and bring honor and glory to your Son, Jesus, for all that has gone on today, the hearts that were touched by your word, and looking forward, Father, tonight, your message and your Holy Spirit's ministry among us. Oh, Father God, let our hearts be open to be touched by the Holy Spirit, that our lives might be changed, and that our, everything that we see will be in in retrospect to what we have learned tonight. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Revelation, excuse me, chapter 20. I apologize. I got my ribbon in the wrong place. Revelation, chapter 20. We have just now finished over a thousand years of, of uh, a kingdom with Jesus Christ, a kingdom that was perfect without any interference of any uh, nation or any government that had been corrupted, a perfect savior, a perfect king, a perfect kingdom. And yet, when Satan has been released, the world will absolutely go for him again. And there will be a great battle at the end of the kingdom. We saw that last week. A great battle. So many people will go against Christ. They're, the Bible says they're like the sea, of the, the sand of the sea. Unbelievable. How could this happen? How can this happen to a world that literally has Jesus walking on the road with us? We'll be looking at Jesus. We'll be hearing Jesus. We'll know his voice. We'll see him face to face. All those people that will say, well, the only reason why you know, you're a believer is because you've seen Jesus. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's you, that you haven't seen Jesus and you're using it as a crutch. No, there will be people who believe in Jesus when they see him, but there will be those who reject him also after they know him. It is absolutely mind-boggling to me. How in the world can this happen? Well, at the close of, conclusion of the great battle, at the close of the great battle of Gog and Magog, the second one, the Bible says there's going to be a time of judgment. We're going to see here, beloved, that this judgment is final. This judgment is fatal. This is the last of the judgments that we see in the book of the Bible. This is the last judgment that will ever happen to those who are engrossed in sin. The last judgment that will ever be shown on the face of this earth upon those who have been captured by Satan and his evil uh, sin that he causes others to commit. The writer, of, the writer of Hebrews tells us, Paul, I believe, that it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. You know that Christians do not escape the judgment. You do understand that. We have a judgment. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. And as the bride, we are going to be taken before Jesus. And we are going to be judged for what we have said and what we have done for the kingdom. And we will be rewarded. There will be those who have crowns. There will be rewards of positions in the kingdom. There will be those who just barely make it. There are those who are in on it by the skin of their teeth. Everything they did and everything they have done supposedly for the kingdom was burn up. But there are those who after the kingdom who will literally stand before a holy God and give an account of their life that they have lived in sin. Now, as Christians, we're going to give an account of what we have done for Jesus, not for our sin. Our sin is already judged on Calvary. But there are those who are going to be there in heaven, standing before God, being judged for their life. Some of them, we may know them. We may know these people. I have relatives that will be there. I have family members, close family members that will be there. I have friends that I grew up with that will be there. I have acquaintances, total strangers, people I've worked with that will be there. And you know, the hope of, the, the hope of all hopes is that you and I will speak to someone before they go there and reach them for the Lord. I must say that this judgment that we're going to talk about is a very severe judgment. 
This is the last judgment. There is no turning back. There is no second chance. There is no hope, Pastor. There will be no appeals, no higher court to go to. This judgment is final, and this judgment is complete. Sinners will be judged for every act of sin that they have ever done. Hitler will be there. If he never received Christ in his lifetime, Hitler will be there. I can't believe those type of people would be in heaven, but these people are lost and they are going to be before God, the Hitlers of the world, the Stalins of the world, and the moral individuals, the grandmother, the father, the mother, the children, who are moral, kind people without Christ will be there. Sinners will be judged for every act of sin, every approval of sin, and every motivating thought of sin. God will show them in that time exactly what they've done. Now, I don't know how he's going to do that. The Bible doesn't describe that. You know, sometimes the Bible doesn't describe exactly the full extent about how he's going to do it, but he describes it's going to happen, just like the judgment seat of Christ. How is that going to happen for every Christian? Now, do we believe that Christians are judged by Christ before the, the time of, of uh, judgment? Or as they go into heaven, are they judged right then and there, perhaps? Are we going to do it all carte blanche and by churches? Perhaps. I don't know. Except the fact that I do know we're all going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. But this judgment is going to be judged upon every act of sin. Every thought, every approval. Let's start with verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. That has to be the saddest part of a verse here in the Bible. And there's a lot of these like this, but this is a sad part. Look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The first thing we're going to see here are the participants of the judgment. There are people that are going to be there. The, again, these are people that we may know. These are relatives. Now, I've had relatives who are atheists. I had relatives that had rejected Christ. I had relatives all my life that I've met that they were foolish about their, their uh, everlasting uh, life and where they were going to go to spend eternity. But now they're going to have to answer to God. We see the divine participant in verse 11. They're not the only ones going to be there. There's going to be a divine participant. Someone is going to be there to judge them. It's not just a, a computer somewhere recording what's been done. The Bible says in verse 8, we see his person. The Bible says very simply, in verse 11, excuse me, and I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. That him is Jesus. We see it's going to be the Lord, his person. All judgment, by the way, has been given to Jesus. This meek and mild carpenter of Galilee, this one who spoke about turning the other cheek, this one who said if the, someone asks you for your cloak, you give them your shirt also. This Jesus will be the judge. John 5.22 says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Jesus is going to judge. The Lord is going to sit on the throne. And it's not going to be the merciful Lord Jesus. This is the one who's going to judge with great terror. We see his power. The Bible says in verse 11, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. From whose face? The lovely Lord who hung upon the cross. We saw his face in torture, in agony. We saw him with the crown of thorns upon his head who cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the same Jesus they laughed and scorned, they spit upon, they beat, 
and looked upon his face. The Bible says his face was a face that wasn't even like a human being. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says his visage was scarred. Folks, this same Jesus will be the one who has the face, the Bible says, the whole heavens and the earth flee from. His power. Then we see his purity also in verse 11. The Bible says, and there was, uh, and the Bible says, and the one who sat on it, meaning he has the throne, the holiness of God. He is the one who's going to be holy. The earth and the heaven is going to flee from him. Why? Because they are evil and he is holy. They are sinful and he is holy. Revelation 4, 8, the Bible says, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and who is to come. Speaking of Jesus, who was? Who was? Jesus was and always has been. Who is? Who was dead and now is alive and is to come. The second coming. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. We see here also his prohibition. The prohibition is found in verse 11 again, and there was found no place for them. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that tragic? There was found no place for them. Again, I shared it before. That has got to be part, some of the most saddest verses in the Bible, and this is one of them. And they found there was no place found for them. Not everyone is going to go to heaven. You know, I've heard all my life, well, God is love. And because God is love, everyone is going to die and go to heaven. You can believe like a Buddhist. You can believe like a, a Taoist. You can believe like a, a uh, some of the African nations. You can be one of the natives there. You can do this and that. You can believe like all these people. But folks, the Bible says that unless you are born again, unless you have Christ, you are none of His. That's why we send missionaries all over the world. That's why we send people to the far-flung places to reach people who have never heard about Jesus. That's why we send missionaries to go and speak to them not only of the temporal things such as food and clothing, not only the temporal things like, like taking care of themselves, but also the eternal things about there is a Savior who loves them and a Savior who cares. It's not enough that you feed a hungry person, beloved, and turn them loose. You need to be able to tell them about the love of Jesus because if we do not do it, they're going to be in this place one day. The Bible says, and there was found no place for them. How tragic. That's our family. That's our friends. That's our neighbors. That's our boss. That's the people who work for us. This is going to be those people who stand there one day and the Bible says there was no place found for them. Look at verse 12, the dead participants. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. God is keeping track of what is being going on in this world. There's not someone down somewhere in the darkest part of the earth, somewhere in some jungle, or way far away in some desert that does something that God does not know about it. Oh, there are those who, who like Achan, they will do what they want to do and they'll hide their treasure somewhere, their sin somewhere, thinking nobody has saw them and nobody knows, but God knows. We see the rejectors, those who are rebellious, who reject Jesus the agnostics, the atheists, those people who say to their, to their people, I don't believe in God. Just recently we had a, a man and it broke my heart. Hitchens, is, I forget his first name, I think it was David. Was considered one of the foremost atheists of our world. Came down with a cancer and he was talking to, cancer of the throat, and he was talking to one of the, the hosts of a TV show and he says, I know that there are Christians who have written me and said they're happy that I've got this. And finally, old David Hitchens will die. And it was tragic, sorrowful to hear of that. There's nobody in heaven going to be clapping when they bring the atheist before God and pronounce the curse 
and doom of eternity upon them. No one will be selling tickets and 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 pennants and popcorn in the in the the gallery when people watch as as the God of God of all gods literally speaks to these people and sends them to an eternity in hell. There will be no joy in this. We see the religious people, the good people without Jesus, church members, people who thought all their lives that they all they had to do was do good things. No one ever told them about Jesus. Church members in Catholic churches and Methodist churches and Presbyterian churches and Southern Baptist churches who have thought all their life all they had to do was go to church and read their Bible, throw a few nickels in the plate, and that's what took care of it. Not being saved. And then the resistors, those who procrastinate. Those who say, not now, not now, not now. I've had people come through our doors. We have had people come through this door who were lost and needed Jesus and walked out this door the same as they came in because they said, not now. What a tragedy. No one's joyful in that. There'll be no songs being sung. There'll be no roaring, no waves being in the crowd. Folks, there'll be sadness and sorrow. Imagine seeing your, your beloved grandmother stand before God and have God speak this horrible sentence upon her. Or seeing your grandfather or your mother or your father or your friends standing before God and seeing them all stand before God and having this judgment. We see the, partic the participants of the judgment. But look at the particulars. In verse 12 and 13. Look at the words of sovereignty in verse 12. The Bible says again, and another, the Bible says, and the book was opened. The books were opened. Notice they're plural, not singular. And the books were opened. There have been a lot of people speculate what these books were. I've heard people all my life say, well, it's, it's according to what God has done. But you know, God has one book, the Bible says later on in that same verse. Notice that. And which is the, and the book was open. And another book was open. Singular. God has a book. Now, how big is that book? I have no clue. But we see here, beloved, there's another book. We see the books of the law. Many preachers believe that this, the, when it talks about the books will be open, speaks of the Bible. And all 66 books will be opened up to judge people. Those people that said, I don't believe in that Bible. I've had people all my life. I don't believe that Bible. It's error. It's full of errors. It's got contradictions. And when I go to quote scriptures, they begin to curse and say all manner of evil against it. God's holy word will judge them. In John chapter 12 and verse 8, it says, And he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. This same Bible that people throw, that burn, will not let us pass them out out there in the, in the, in the schools. The last time we had someone of the, of the Gideons go and pass out New Testaments in a high school across the street. He stood out there on the, on the, uh, uh, the, the, the wave there with the government, no, not the government, but the city or state owns part of it. And so he stood out there as far as many of you knew Lloyd. And he stood out there as far as he could away from the property and he was handing out these big orange New Testaments. Man, these people, kids were sticking their hands out the bus and grabbing them. And they had a guy come out there and said, you will have to leave. And Lloyd said, why? They want him. You have to leave, sir. He had given away, thank God, three or four boxes of the New Testaments. They were reaching out like they were reaching out for candy, grabbing them. That same book is going to judge them. And then the book of the Lamb is going to come. That's God's holy register. That book, that one book in verse 12, the Bible says, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So we've got books also. There are several other books that are available here. We have the book of the Lamb. That is the, the, book, of, the book of the law and the book of the Lamb. That's God's holy register. That book of the Lamb is Jesus' holy register of the bride. Every person who is born again is in that book. They'll be there and say, check again. Please, Jesus, one more time. Surely my name is in that book. 
Surely my name was written in there. Surely this must be a mistake. Maybe the page stuck together. Jesus, check one more time. I was a good church member. I was a preacher of the church. I was a deacon. I was a Sunday school teacher. Check one more time, please. Their name will not be in that book, but it'll be there to cross-reference. And then the Bible says there are other books. Again, look again at verse 12. The Bible says, by the things which are written in the books. In the books. Well, why? God's keeping books, folks. Everything that's been said wrong, everything that's done wrong, everything that's thought wrong, the holy angels perhaps are writing in these books since the books of life of people. People say, well, I, I didn't do that, Lord. Sorry. On July 15th, 1904, you did this. You went out there to that poor widow and you foreclosed on her home. You did this and you did that. They're going to go through all that. Listen, folks, no one's going to get escape from this. No one. There'll not be one evil banker, not be one evil poor person, not one evil robber, not one evil thief, not one poor person or rich person who will not be able to escape the judgment of Christ. We see in verse 13, the, worker, the works of sinners. The works of sinners. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the dead in the Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. That's that book at the, at the end of verse 12. By the things which are written in the books, they'll be judged one another according to his works. You see, they'll be judged as sinners. Their filthy rags will be examined. Isaiah 64, 6 says, But we all like are an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquity, like the wind, has taken us away. Oh, folks, listen. They'll say, oh, but I've been a good person, Lord. I've been a good person. I've, I've done this and that. And folks, the Bible says, even our righteousness is as filthy rags. The best you and I could do is as a filthy rag. The best that we could do all the work that we've done outside of Jesus, the best it could be considered is filthy rags. The only thing we do that will last is for Jesus. So let me say to you, beloved, while you can live for Jesus, do what you do for Jesus. You say, well, I can't do anything. I don't have anything or, or nobody knows my talent. Listen, pray. Can you pray? You pray for, for people. You see people in church, you pray for them. You see people on the streets, you pray for them. You see people at work, you pray for them. Intercede for them. Beloved, there'll be a reward for this. The Bible says you cannot even fill a cup of cold water without a reward in the name of Jesus. Can you give a cup of cold water to somebody? Can you say in Jesus' name, I give you this water? I give you this wonderful thing in the name of Jesus. Can you do that, folks? Listen, there's not going to be one Christian who stands before the Lord and says, I didn't have a talent. I don't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. My pastor didn't let me do anything. Folks, listen. We're not going to be able to stand before Jesus and say that. And neither of these people. They won't be able to stand before Jesus and say, hey, no one told me. We see they'll be judged as sinners and they'll be judged as rejectors. Again, the only unforgivable sin, the only sin that sends you to hell, the only one sin, that's why it's not going to take forever. They're going to be judged for their sins, but the Bible says there's only one sin that sends us to hell. And that is the rejection of Jesus as the Savior. The rejection of Christ as the Savior and receiving Him as their Lord. 1 John 5.12 says, He who has the Son has life. And he who is not the Son of God does not have life. Folks, it's as plain as that. As Christians, folks, we need to live our lives for Jesus. I believe we have an obligation to do more and more and more for Christ. You know, I've had people on my life, well, I'm getting ready to t retire and I'm just going to coast on down the line. Folks, this is the time to kick it into gear. The closer we are coming to Jesus' is coming, we need to kick it more in gear. Folks, sometimes the older people have more options than the younger people have. I like little Mr. Adams. He was in his 80s the last time I saw him. 
He got saved when he was in his late 60s. He decided to give his life totally for God. He said, I lived almost all my life for myself and for the world. He said, I want to live for Jesus. And he'd call us up and say, you got any calls for me? He'd call us up and say, where can I go? Can I go to the hospital? Is there someone that needs an extra call? Is there another home I can go to? And he'd go everywhere he could. I said, Mr. Adams, we got people to do this. You don't need to do this. He said, oh, but I have to. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I've got to make up for what I haven't done yet. And oh, he had an urgency in his heart. I'm sure by now that he's gone home to be with the Lord. He was in his 80s when I last saw him. I'm sure 16 years later, he's probably home with the Lord. What a sweet time. But oh, folks, let me say to you, Christian, live for Jesus now while you can. There is a judgment coming. There is a time we have to stand before Jesus. And everything will be judged according to His holiness. And everything will be judged according to what He determines. And it won't be our sin that's judged, folks. Not like here in this particular passage. It won't be our sin that is judged, but our works. What have you done for Jesus? You say, well, I do a lot of things. Well, do you do it for Jesus and not for yourself? You know, I, I, we used to joke about in, in First Church, we, we, we talked about giving. Our envelopes were white. In First Church, our envelopes were pink. You could see them all over the place. And so when people gave, it's like pulled out this big, huge, you know, pink envelope and waved it around and threw it in a plate, you know. Why do you give? You know, I, you, know you give money and the missionaries get it. Where does it go? I think God keeps track of every dime and nickel and penny that we give. I think God keeps track of every time we come to church. I think God keeps track of everything we do, folks. Don't you? Don't you believe that we have a God that knows all things? Well, why would He be interested in that? Folks, for a Christian, He'll be able to reward us. Don't you look for things to give your children reward for? Don't you look for things to to say to your children, that's a good thing. You did a good thing. Here, let me give you something. Don't you do that? You ought to. How about grandkids? Wouldn't you like to reward your grandkids? Don't you look for reasons to do that? Well, see, God does the same for us. And He wants to reward us. But here are these people, participants of judgment. What a tragedy. Let's look at verse 14 and 15. We see not only the participants and the particulars of the judgment, but we see the pronouncement of judgment in verse 14 and 15. Verse 14, again, is tragic. It's, again, one of those tragic verses in the Bible. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. See, that's the ultimate end. There are people right now, when they die, when a lost person dies, they don't go to the lake of fire, folks. They go to a place called Hades or hell. And there they are in this place. And it's not a permanent place. Do you know, as we see here in chapter 20, there's going to be a resurrection, but it is called the resurrection of the damned. You want to talk about all your zombies that are on TV today? Folks, all these dead people will be brought back to life in these old putrefied bodies. They'll be brought to this throne room and there they're going to be given this judgment. The Bible says they're going to be taken out of Hades. You know, there was a place called Paradise that people went before Jesus' resurrection. And all the Old Testament saints would go to this place called Paradise. And there was Paradise and there was Hades. And the Bible says you could see each other from the other side. Remember, they're in Luke. The Bible says that the rich man looked and saw Lazarus from afar off in Abraham's bosom, which is Paradise. Well, they don't have that today because Paradise is empty. Paradise was taken to heaven when Jesus resurrected. So... You and I, when we die, the Bible says, Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But these people, when they die, they are still inhabiting this place called Hades, this place called hell. And it's a place of torment. It's a place of sadness. 
It's a place of great distress and anxiety. It's a place where people will literally be whatever they are for eternity. If they're a drug addict, they'll be a drug addict for all eternity. If they all the different sins that they're caught up into, they will have those same desires, those same manipulations for all eternity. What a tragedy. What a horrible thing. We see it's a physical death in verse 14. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. These people are going to have a physical death again. Is it appointed on a man once to die? You know, we're all going to die. I don't like that concept. I don't sit around and think, lay there in my bed in the morning and think, well, this is how I'm going, this is how I'm going to look. You know? Get a mirror hanging over there, you know, okay, let me see, get the neck just right, you know, so I don't show my double chin and all that good stuff. No, we don't do that. But we're going to die. Folks, when I'm gone, that old body will be laying in the ground somewhere, but I'll be with Christ in heaven. Again, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. But these people are going to have their physical bodies resurrected in this resurrection of the damned, and they will stand before Jesus. And God is going to judge them, and the lake of fire, or excuse me, and, and Hades and death will be cast into the lake of fire. We'll see it's also a permanent death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We understand that as Christians, we have an escape from this second death. But the tragedy is my I have relatives who haven't escaped that. I had a, I had a great-grandfather who I was named after who was an atheist. He was, a, he was so foolish that they would try to witness him, tell him about the Lord. Oh, Jesus died when I was a little boy, he used to say. I thought, how, as a young person, I used to think, how ignorant is that? And now I've gotten older, how tragic that is. You know, I, 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 I love my family. I don't want my family to go to hell. But yet here is one who's already before me. And I will see him in that time stand before Christ and judgment be poured out upon him. A permanent death. But also in verse 15, we see a separating death. A separating death. There's a separation, of course, by choice. Look at verse 15. And everyone not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's why that book is there. An angel will say, Lord, is his name written in the book of life? Or the, someone will cry out and the Lord will say, no. The name is not in the book of life. And they will cast them into the lake of fire. The Bible says that if we receive Jesus, we receive life. If we reject Jesus, then we receive the second death. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. The Bible doesn't say it is appointed unto man twice to die. Why is that? Because God would wish that none should perish. That's why people say, how can a loving, caring God send anyone to hell? The truth of it is, folks, God sends no one to hell. They send themselves. They choose. It is a willful choice to go to heaven or to go to hell. You say, well, what about the person who doesn't know? What about the person who doesn't see? Folks, I don't believe that there is a person who doesn't know about God. You say, well, how about that person way out in the... In the jungle, they know about God today. And they know about missionaries. They go into the towns now. They don't stay way out there. And they hear the news. They hear things. I share with, again, when, when T.B. Smith was here, one of the most fascinating stories that he shared with me is the time he went to Africa. And he said to me, he said, John, he says, this is the most fascinating thing. He says, a, a black... Uh, uh, guy was with the guide was with me and he was a, a pastor and I was you know a, a pastor at the time and anyway we went into this village and there was a man sitting on a stool there in the front yard which was all dirt and we walked up to him and and I said to the interpreter we're here to tell you about Jesus and he shot up got up just jumped up ran into his little hut and brought out two chairs and said sit down and tell me I want you to know I'm ready and they shared Christ with him and wanting to the Lord. And then they say, why were you so ready? 
Had somebody come by and talk to you about the Lord? Did some preacher come early and give you a Bible? Did somebody come by and missionary come by and give you the good news? He says, no, I was in a dream. And God told me that a white man was going to come with a black man and that they were going to tell me good news that I needed to listen. And he says, and you came when I was waiting for you to come. And walks his wife with some groceries in her. And she had gone way into the way in the thing with some, some get some groceries. And, and he says to her, these are the ones I told you about this morning. And they, she sat down and she got saved. Now, I, folks, I believe that God speaks to hearts all over. There'll be no one to say, no one cared for my soul. We see the separation is by choice. And the separation, folks, is by curse. The second death is the eternal curse of sin. The Bible says that it's appointed for us once to die. That's, that's the penalty of sin. We're all going to die unless we're raptured. Now, I, I personally believe the rapture, because of Scripture, is a so instantaneous death that you, your body didn't even hit the ground when it's resurrected. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and so we're going to die, but we're going to be resurrected at the same time. But the bottom line is this, folks. We're not appointed to die the second death. That's a choice because it's the curse of sin, and it was given from the very beginning. He told Adam, the day you eat this fruit, that day you will surely die. And he did eventually. He died the physical death. Didn't have to die the second death, though, did he? In, in Revelation chapter 21 and 6 through 8, we see a tragedy. 21 and 8 says, and, this, and he said to me, it is done, and I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who, who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall, be, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The tragedy of all of this is no one has to go there. No one. Moms, dads, sons, daughters, uncles, aunts, cousins, good friends, neighbors, work associates, they don't have to go there. If you're a Christian, rejoice. Rejoice. This is a sad time indeed, but you have reason to rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And it's very important that you know that. But you know, you may know someone who isn't. You may know someone's name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, what can I do, preacher? You can tell them. You can pray for them. Give them a Bible. Give them a tract. Fight them to church. We still have that time. You, know. you can be that person to bring that person to Christ. What an opportunity. What if they were the last person? What if the person you brought to Jesus here to this church would get saved and the Bible would know that writing down in the book that that would be the last person to be saved? Wouldn't that be exciting? I think it would be. Folks, judgment is coming. For you and me, it's coming. I don't fear Jesus. I really don't. I fear the, the opportunity of losing rewards that I thought maybe I had, but because I didn't do it for the right reason. Did it for me, not for Jesus. I fear for myself and some of the things I think I was going to have, but I don't, I'm not going to. But I don't fear Jesus. But there are those people, beloved, who are going to have to stand before the judge at the great white throne. And they need to fear that Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time you've given us. And Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, we know that now is the time you love us. Now is the time you care. Now is the time you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Father God, if we are not busy about doing your work, then who will? And oh, Father God, give us wisdom. Give us strength. Give us encouragement that we might reach out to people who need Jesus today. 
Whatever decision that we made tonight, Father, there are those who need to pray for someone. There are those who need to come and, and perhaps pray for themselves. Whatever, Father God, you've touched hearts. You've spoken to hearts. You let the work be done tonight. It is your time of decision. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.